This week on Quality Digest Live, we chat with Mehul Shah of LNS Research about enterprise quality management. Plus, what do Baldrige directors have to say about pressing social issues and the Baldrige criteria? We'll find out when we come back. This week's sponsor of Quality Digest Live is 360 Performance Circle, your destination for today's best training tools. Streaming online now. Welcome back to Quality Digest Live for June 13, 2014. QDL is your weekly look at who and what is making the news in the world of quality. I'm Mike Richmond, publisher of Quality Digest. And I'm Quality Digest Editor-in-Chief, Dirk Ducharme. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Ryan Day. Quality Digest Special Projects Manager and a contributing editor is, um, I guess you'd call him a gearhead. A gearhead, yes, yeah, sir. Kind of a self-proclaimed uh, grease monkey. So when he gets, as he often does, invites from Ford to attend some sort of unveiling, he, <laughs> I don't know, kind of whines and grovels and let me go, let me go. Let yeah, me go, you know, yeah. Because he wants to go see those things. He does. So every now and then we let him out of the building. So last week, Ryan heads out to San Francisco's Mission District to get the lowdown on a partnership between Ford Motor Company and Samsung SDI to develop lightweight, highly advanced lithium-ion batteries for Ford's uh, you know, new hybrid and electric vehicles, as well as another partnership with both Lockheed Martin and Samsung to develop a lightweight concept car. Um, at this event, Ford describes how the goal is to create lighter weight vehicles with all the same features and size that customers want, and yet still improve gas mileage and reduce CO2 emissions. Remember, the, 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 the auto companies are under a lot of pressure right now mm -hmm. to get CO2 emissions down, but they're also under customer pressure to keep giving us the big honking cars that yeah. we Americans like to drive. That we like to drive, How sure. do you do that? Well, one way is to reduce weight. So you need to lighten up vehicles where you can use lighter and more efficient batteries and also develop more efficient regenerative systems for those batteries. And that's kind of what this, this meeting in uh, this press event in San Francisco mm -hmm. was all about. So all this takes new technologies and manufacturing techniques. We have a little clip here from Ford. You're going to see Matt uh, Zalazek, senior technical leader for Ford's uh, research and innovation. A lot of the technologies that you're seeing demonstrated on this vehicle are not ready for high volume production, but the message around this vehicle is it could be built into a high volume capable product. Light weighting does not come for free. We're getting very good at looking how to offset the cost by consolidating parts and using next generation manufacturing processes. It's really about taking out weight to improve fuel efficiency, reducing CO2 emissions, basically making a good product even better. And that was via YouTube there, um, for uh, a clip from Ford. Um, I don't know if you heard it, but toward the end of that little clip, there was a nod toward additive manufacturing. Uh, a lot of light weighting involves making components that can't be manufactured using methods other than additive manufacturing. We've kind of discussed this on the show before, and that's kind of what light weighting is about, is how do you optimize uh, the design of the vehicle so that you can cut weight where it isn't really necessary and maintain the strength and of course weight where it's needed. So that was really what this Ford event was all about. So Ryan comes back all excited and excited about the technology for sure. But what's interesting is that he actually came back excited about something else. At the very end of his article after talking about all this tech stuff that he got to see, Ryan writes, there's no doubt the technology is all very cool, but more significant as far as I'm concerned are the partnerships being forged between companies and the relationships being made between human beings. Ryan goes on to say, everything worthwhile in life happens in the context of relationships. During my conversations with industry leaders, I am continually impressed with how significant the personal relationships are to the success of not just products, but also the far-reaching vision that fuels innovation solutions to complex issues. Absolutely. Yeah. Every company brings not only its own set of, of technical skills and technology to a partnership, but also its culture. And what we're seeing more and more is that this is no small thing. Learning how another company solves problems and develops a culture of innovation is every bit as important to the partnership as the technology. And actually, we're going to be talking about this more mm -hmm. uh, in the future. But this was just kind of, a, kind of something that came up all of a sudden out of this. Yeah. Really was surprised when Ryan came back and talked about that. So like I said, you're going to see us talk 
talking about this more in the future. Uh, good job, Brian. And uh, I don't know, I hear the Yugo's coming back, so maybe well, uh, we'll send him to see the next Yugo unveiling. Sure, sure he'd, be big. he'd be great with that. Oh, yeah, uh, absolutely. You, you know, it's, it's interesting. A couple of the interesting things about this for me, and having been actually out to some Ford events w with Ryan as well in the past. Um, you know, Ford really, uh, you know, obviously, you know, we talk about Ford a lot, and we talk about the history of Ford a lot, and, because it's, it's central to the, to the idea of quality in manufacturing, is the Ford Motor Company. Um, but what they're doing now, and, and the partnerships they're forging, and the, and the personal relationships they're forging, as Ryan mentions, are really important. It's not a coincidence that this event took place where? In San Francisco. I mean, these are the companies, the Silicon Valley companies, that Ford realizes they need to partner with. Technology, yeah. And, and, and it's, it's really kind of cool, I think, that you see a, a kind of an old line manufacturing Rust Belt company, you know, based in Detroit still, that is also now reaching out to Silicon Valley. This is going to be manufacturing going forward. It's going to be the basis of what we know as manufacturing, we've known for a long time, joining hands with technology. And, and it's really exciting, it's really cool stuff, and, and look forward to a lot more from Ryan uh, and Ford coming up in the future on yep. those stories. Okay, also in the news this week, Discovery Education and the Alcoa Foundation are teaming up on a new website to provide free resources to develop critical thinking and STEM skills to students and those that support them. And of course, STEM, as we all know, as we talk about a lot, science, technology, engineering, and math. And, and these are the skill sets that we need American school kids uh, to have as we, they begin to enter the workforce because we want them to have that foundation of knowledge in, in, those, in those, those skills so they can move in and take over the jobs that are going to be uh, being vacated by people that are retiring. Well, the site we're talking about, which is found at www.manufactureyourfuture.com, is designed not only for students, but also for educators, counselors, and parents. The content includes lesson plans, career guides, and videos showing what goes into jobs and fields such as mechanical engineering and robotics. It's kind of cool. I, I poked around the site a little bit the other day, and, and there's videos of people talking about what they do, mechanical engineers, robotics, and, and there's lesson plans, again, to help, help stu educators and counselors uh, and parents uh, understand and help kids understand what manufacturing is all about and, and what these careers may be sure. available here. As we say, it's not just spinning bolts anymore. It's not. Yeah. It's really cool. It's really high-tech, interesting, interesting stuff. Now, fostering conversations about manufacturing careers, as we know, is the first step toward developing those industrial workers of tomorrow. There, there's still something of a stigma. I mean, there's no doubt. There's something of a stigma among school kids in this country as far as careers in manufacturing are concerned. They're, they're parents, actually, more than anything. <laughs> yeah, the parents yeah. and the kids, both uh, of it. Um, and, and engaging those kids and their mentors in an early stage, again, this is, uh, I mean, I mentioned this is grade 6 through 12, so again, these kids fairly early. Uh, that helps to lessen those fears and misconceptions and I think will eventually lead towards more kids examining this uh, as an option for, for their careers, which we, of course, desperately need. So, for more information on this news item, and in fact, all the pieces that Dirk and I are going to be covering on today's show, be sure to check out the story links just below or just to the right of the video player, or just below the video yeah. player, should be right down there. All right. Um, in his latest article, Three Major Quality Management Gaps and How to Fill Them, LNS Research President Matt Littlefield states that there is a gap in the ability of many organizations to effectively deliver quality products and processes. Uh, Alanis Research has done a lot of uh, research uh, into these quality management gaps during the past several years and determined that what is needed is what they call closed loop quality processes. What is a closed loop quality process? What are these gaps that we're talking about? Uh, well, here to tell us is Mehul Shah, Senior Associate at LNS Research. Hi, Mehul. Hey, Dark, how are you? Oh, pretty good. Um, so before we get going, let's just, why don't you tell us what you mean by a closed loop quality process? Define that for us. Definitely. So Dirk, first of all, I'm excited to be part of the live event. Um, you know, when you talk about closed loop and when you talk about quality, you know, people generally think, you know, if you think about a quality of product, it's quality within a manufacturing process. But it's definitely more than that. And for that, you have to look at you know, what your product life cycle is. You, know, you start your product in the you know, research and development engineering department where you develop your product, you know, come up with ideas, and there are quality processes within the R&D design department. After that, you look at you know, sourcing your parts from your suppliers and uh, you know, making sure that you're getting the components within the manufacturing floor from your supplier base, and you know, depending on what industry you're in. Right? If you're in automotive, there are multi-tiered uh, supplier base and you have to manage quality across that supplier base. And then you talk about manufacturing. So that's where you have all your components and you manufacture a product. And 
I think a lot have been written about managing quality within manufacturing. Uh, once the product goes out of the manufacturing, you know, it goes you know, in the hands of your customers, you're talking about issues like you know, customer service, warranty, um, issues in the field, um, and you know, there are quality issues around that. What we mean by closed loop is if you're really looking to be the highest quality product in the marketplace, you can't just manage quality in one area of this value chain. You need to have process and visibility to manage quality across all of these different value stages to make sure that you are you know, putting the best product out in the marketplace. And I think the final part is once your product is out, that's not when your responsibility ends for quality because you know, you're gonna get complaints, you're gonna get feedback from your customers. How are you able to accept and uh, use all of the feedback and comments back to your you know, engineering or manufacturing team to continuously improve your product? So that's what we mean by the entire loop of quality, closed loop quality management processes. Okay, well let's talk about some of the, some of the gaps. I mean, in his article, Matt, uh, he, he lists uh, three gaps in a quality management system. Uh, I think there was uh, uh, people in leadership, uh, technology, uh, uh, business processes. But let's, let's talk about the first one just briefly here. Uh, he talked about being able to measure the gaps, right? And then you need to do something about it. So in people in leadership, how do you even measure a gap in people in leadership? And how does a closed loop quality management process even address that? So I think that's a very good question, Dirk. Um, you know, when it comes to leadership and you know qualities like this, it's all tangible. And whenever things are tangible, it's really difficult to measure. Um, I think what we see is if you're looking to manage, you know, quality from a closed loop perspective, um, one is it has to come directly from the leadership. You know, we have we work with a lot of companies as part of our executive council. We generally see you know corporate quality team or a VP of global quality or some very senior level position who probably reports up to, you know, probably one or two level down to the CEO. So, you know, we see organizations that has a commitment towards quality and that has a very senior executive that has visibility and control over the, you know, operations entire value chain and who looks into quality is one of the key areas. I think when it comes to measurement, I think those are the common measurements that we see. You know, if you are able to, uh, you know, have collaboration between each of these departments, if you are able to you know, have leadership capabilities for folks who are managing your engineering, um, manufacturing service, and, you know, have the context of quality around it. I mean, the, the, the measure you will see is, you know, better quality products, less supplier issues, uh, you know, higher overall equipment effect effectiveness within your manufacturing floor. You know, all of those uh, key criteria that a lot of organizations measure, you will directly see an impact on those issues. Well, how about the next one of these gaps that, that Matt talked about in this piece, the, the, the idea of business processes. What are the major gaps that you see there? So I think the whole aspect of business process is important, right? I mean, when we talk about business process in the context of quality, you know, we see in a variety of this business process. I talked about suppliers there. I think the, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of issues when it comes to suppliers. One is, you know, one is if you have a, a tiered supplier base, uh, you know, now you're not only uh, liable for the quality that your suppliers provide you, but you know, also your supplier's supplier provide you. So you know, how do you ma make sure that you have a process that's streamlined to manage your qual uh, supply, uh, quality across your entire supplier base? And just imagine if you're a global organization, not only just in North America, you, know, you have plants in Europe and you have plants in Asia, and they all have their suppliers. How do you manage that long of a supplier base in a way that you are able to effectively manage quality across the value chain. Similarly, if you take another process like CAPA, you know, we, I mean, it's a very, very common process, corrective and preventive action. Uh, you know, companies have CAPA at the plant level, companies have CAPA at the enterprise level. Uh, all of those, pro you know, most of the time these processes are disjointed depending on how mature your organization is. You know, how do you make sure there's a standardized process for managing CAP across your enterprise so that, you know, people know what they are doing and people know how to do it and executives have clear visibility of all of these processes uh, that will eventually lead to better quality products. Okay, and finally, Amihul, let's, let's talk a little bit about technology gaps because uh, we actually have a, 
we have a webinar mm -hmm. coming up here uh, pretty soon, and I believe one of the things it's going to talk about is basically how technology, uh, software in particular, uh, addresses kind of all of these gaps, uh, and so in particularly technology. So why don't you talk about that a little bit, technology and how it addresses these issues? I think that's that's again a good question, uh, Dirk. You know, one of the things that we saw, you know, we surveyed over you know more than 900 organizations globally, uh, mostly on the quality organization, and that's something that we're going to talk about as part of the webcast. You know, we saw that 78 percent of that 900 plus organization, they they say that they have disjointed and disconnected quality process. And you know, for those companies, one of the ways uh, I think there are many ways you can address this, but one of the ways that you can address this is the implementation of right set of tools, technology, software, so that you can enable that visibility across the value chain. Uh, one of the things we talked about, uh, we'll talk about in the webcast, uh, as well you, you'll see a lot uh, in our research is uh, the term enterprise quality management software. Um, and again, it's not uh, by no means a new term. Uh, you know, it's basically a, a platform um, which provides you the ability to manage quality uh, in a closed loop fashion and manage quality holistically across the organization. Uh, normally, you know, what we see is when companies are adapting software, uh, you know, they'll have an immediate pain. You know, they want to manage their audit process, they want to automate that, and they'll you know, implement an audit uh, management system. Or they're going to manage a CAPA uh, issue and they have that pain point and they'll implement a CAPA process or a CAPA software. But what we're seeing is mature companies, companies that are able to drive, uh, you know, closed loop quality management are investing in EQMS platform, enterprise quality management platform, so that you're not working with you know, multiple spreadsheet, multiple systems, desperate data sources. You have one single platform. You know, we all talk about a single version of truth um, that will enable you to manage all of these different quality processes, which eventually will help you build that closed loop quality management strategies and processes within your organization. Right, right. Well, great. Well, Mihul, thanks again for joining us today. We're out of time, uh, but for all of us, all of you out there who, who want to learn more about this, uh, Dirk, you referenced it. We do have a webinar coming up on Tuesday. Dirk and Mihul will be uh, co-presenting that. Actually, Mihul's presenting. Dirk is just hosting, as he normally does. Uh, that is next Tuesday, the 17th. It's going to be at our normal time, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. And there is a link out in Matt's article <clears throat> right. to that. Um, also, keep an eye on your email. Uh, Dirk, take it away. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so Mike is, is, is Mike, once, Frog once again calls him Mike. So yeah, you'll be getting an email if you haven't already yep. uh, to sign up for this uh, sign up for this webinar. Be sure you do it. It's on the, uh, what did we say, the 17th? The 17th, 17th at, at, yeah, at 11, uh, 11 a.m. Uh, Pacific, 2 p.m. Yep. Eastern. So uh, sign up for that if you want to learn more about uh, EQMS software and how that can close the, uh, uh, close the gaps in your quality management system. So Mayhul, thanks again for joining us. We'll see you on Tuesday. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Dirk. Okay. See, see you then. Mayhul. Thanks. Bye -bye. Good stuff. Thanks, Derek. I know you're looking forward to that one. It's be <laughs> yeah, it'll be good, fun. Good These are webinar. always good. In informative. Informative. Yes, definitely. So check that out. Okay. Well, uh, one more feature article, actually two feature articles that we covered this week that I want to get to quickly uh, came from actually the two most recent Baldur's directors, uh, two people that we've had both on the show right. and that we talked about uh, often in the past. Uh, and these two articles ran this week in Quality Digest Daily. The first one uh, actually came from uh, Robert Fangmeyer. And Robert Fangmeyer is the uh, current Baldur's director. And his piece uh, appeared in, I believe it was Monday's issue of Quality Digest Daily. And it was called, Is There a Solution to the Challenges uh, in Healthcare? And again, that appeared in Monday's issue of Quality Digest Daily. Both of these articles, uh, the one from Fangmeyer that I'm going to talk about now, uh, and the other one that I'm going to talk about here in a moment, uh, both dealt with social issues. They both kind of dealt with the idea that the Baldrige framework, the Baldrige criteria, the Baldrige program uh, is designed to help help companies improve and that there's these social issues that people can, can use and can take advantage of um, you know, through the Baldrige. So yeah, the first one from, uh, from Robert Fangmeyer was regarding healthcare. And, and so his question was, is there a solution to the challenges in healthcare? And the quick answer was yes. And the, the bigger question, of course, is how? Well, Fangmeyer, Fangmeyer quotes a report from the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, <clears throat> PCAST, um, which claims that systems engineering is the cure to what ails healthcare. And of course, as Fagmeyer states and points out, the Baldrige criteria offers a systems-based approach to improvement and, and kind of always has um, already. And it, it's been a natural fit for healthcare because if you think about it, healthcare increasingly is, is the, is the uh, sector that we see a lot of 
of Baldrige companies doing really well within. I mean, 17, I believe, is the number. 17 Baldrige winners since 1999 have been within the healthcare category. And we actually chatted with one of them, Sutter, uh, Sutter Health, uh, recently on the show, along with, with Robert Fagmeyer. So this idea that healthcare can be affected by Baldrige criteria and that a systems approach can, can help that is a really important one. Now, it illuminates the other story I wanted to chat about, and this one was by former Baldridge uh, director, Harry Hertz, who's, of course, Robert Fangmeyer's predecessor. Uh, Harry Hertz's story appeared in Wednesday's issue of Quality Digitally, and it was called, Can We Ignore Climate Change? <clears throat> and again, it's the same issue. It's that they're looking at these big social issues and they're trying to determine how the Baldridge criteria can adapt to suit that, and, and you know, climate change language, as Hertz points out in his piece, already appears in the Baldrige criteria, but Harry ponders whether or not that language needs to be strengthened, made more comprehensive, so that uh, companies that, that want to uh, apply for Baldrige and use the Baldrige criteria can get more out of that. Um, and again, this issue like healthcare affects all of us. Uh, the Baldrige is striving to capture those inputs and outputs to help organizations better manage risk. Risk is the big thing here. Uh, that's it, kind of is the overarching idea of all this. Um, I think the point to me on both of these pieces is that the, what makes the Baldridge successful is flexibility. And I think that if you think about the Baldridge from, a, from an overall perspective, um, it, it's intended to encompass a lot of things, even things that are sometimes at the edges of the scope of what you would consider quality maybe. Um, and I think that that it, it, it does that because it's really um, kind of an inward facing thing. You know, Baldridge you do for, because you want to do it. It's not like ISO where you kind of maybe times sometimes have to do it. Um, Baldridge is really very much uh, inward facing. It helps you look at your organization, you choose to do it, and it helps you improve uh, and helps you maybe address some of these social issues I, I, as well. I think it puts more of an emphasis on culture. It does, well. yeah. it, it definitely does, as opposed to ISO which is I think more outer facing. It's done more for, well, Baldridge is maybe done for marketing reasons as well many times, but, um, but it, it's, it's really done because you need to do it, you know, your suppliers demand it for ISO in, the, in that case. So I think that, that the criteria itself is flexible enough to encompass that is really the point. Right. And um, yeah, good story. I mean, the, these two stories, both of which I think are really well worth reading, so uh, definitely check them out. They're both below the story page, right, the, the video page right down there. So you can check them out, read them, comment on them, let us know what you think. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll blew through that one quickly because I wanted to get to our tech corner, which Dirk has for us right now. This is a good one uh, that we had from, uh, from an organization by the name of uh, RF Labs, and, and this, uh, I'm sorry, RF System Lab, right there, as you can see. It's the VJ Advanced Boroscope, and Dirk has uh, been practicing all week to do this one for you. <laughs> so he's here with you now to oh, show you all that. <laughs> all right, well thanks Mike. Uh, yeah, as, as Mike said, this is, a, this is the VJ ADV video Borescope from RF System Lab. Uh, you know, we've had, we've had uh, Borescopes, uh, hold on a second here, I gotta see my own, my own little monitor here. Oh well. Um, we've had Borescopes on, on, the, uh, uh, on the show before. Uh, basically you got a little handheld device right here, and you've got the insertion tube. And I want to talk about uh, some of the things that makes this one a little bit unique. Um, first of all, kind of uh, the market for this, for this particular device, by the way, this is very, very lightweight, uh, is basically the aviation industry. Um, uh, according to our system lab, most of their business, at least for this particular model, um, is people doing inspections on um, aircraft engine, particularly uh, business aircraft, also uh, automotive industry, a certain uh, amount in the oil and gas industry, law enforcement, that sort of stuff. So let's kind of go through the basics of what we've got here. First of all, the business part of it is the insertion tube. This is what they call the insertion tube uh, with the, uh, the VJADV video bore scope. These come in three different, uh, three different diameters. The one I happen to have here is their largest diameter. This is a 6.9 millimeter, comes in one and a half. Uh, what, one and a half, three meter, and five meter lengths. Their most popular size is the 3.9 millimeter model. This is the one that use, gets used in aviation quite a bit, one and a half and three meters. But the one that's really surprising is the, um, is the one that um, is 2.8 millimeters in diameter. Now, 2.8 millimeters is about a ninth of an inch. It is the smallest fully articulated uh, insertion, uh, insertion tube um, uh, in the world. And if you think about it, uh, by the way, the way these work, if we can go to the gauge cam right here, and hold on one second, I gotta turn on my, something happened on my monitor right here. 
Uh, hold on a second one, guys. I gotta see what I'm doing, so I'm just gonna step out of the camera here a little bit so I can... All right, there we go. Sorry about that. Okay, so I mentioned that this is a, the, the, the 2.8 millimeter is the fully articulated, uh, all of these are fully articulated insertion tubes. So what we mean is that when you're controlling one of these, you've got this little joystick right here that allows you to move the, allows you to move the tip around. Very often, uh, these are controlled using, uh, using servos. Uh, in this case, it is a direct mechanical linkage. So if you think about a 2.8 millimeter uh, diameter insertion tube, all the linkage still has to fit within that 2.8 millimeter along with the optics and everything. So it's pretty amazing that they can do something like that. Uh, the insertion tube is 100% waterproof, uh, immersible, uh, oil and, uh, oil and um, fuel resistant. Uh, the handheld part of this itself is uh, water, uh, water resistant but not waterproof, so something to keep in mind. So let's kind of just step through the interface here a little bit. If we, look at, uh, if we look at the interface, we've got two buttons on the back side. One of these controls the brightness of the LED. One of them controls video on and off. We'll get to that a little bit. Very simple touch panel uh, control and a little flip up a little flip up screen. There's also a hood that can go over this if you're outside and you need to kind of block the light a little bit. And let's go ahead and take a measure or, or do a, some inspection. Now, obviously, um, I don't have anything that requires a one meter probe, but um, I do have a little device here that we can stick a probe into. And let me just steer the tip to where I want to look at. And I believe I'm looking at right there. I can control the brightness of the LED. Let me get that where we need it, a little bit too bright. There, that should do it. And now you can see you're looking at a video image of the inside of this mechanical part. And you can see that getting a very nice image out of that. Now suppose I wanted to record that. I could hit the record button with my thumb. It was right over here on the left hand side. And now we're recording this image. And now I can record this when I'm done recording. Oh, by the way, while I'm recording, um, there's also a microphone setup where you can wear a little headset plug it into the, uh, the video bore scope and actually annotate while you're recording. Very useful. So you might have, if we can go back to the main camera here, you might have a situation where you're holding the, you're holding the, the, uh, the bore scope with your, uh, your right hand. Maybe you're holding the insertion tube with your left and kind of working it into something and your hands are full. So now you can actually talk while you're taking video and, he, and your hands aren't free to take notes or anything like that. So that is actually a very useful thing. Once you're done taking pictures, video, by the way, you can also take still pictures, little trigger on the side there lets you take still pictures, still or video. Once you're done, you take out the micro SD card, uh, you put in a little adapter that RF system sends with the unit plug that into your computer and you can offload your stills or your video into your laptop. Also, uh, you can connect this directly to another monitor if you need to look at something other than this screen or you can take a USB cable, run it into a laptop and be able to uh, monitor live video via your laptop as well. A couple other things, uh, we've got a temperature probe here so I can, if we go to the screen, uh, if we go to our screen share, you can see I can look at the uh, tip of the probe or turn that off. We can also, um, oh, before we wrap up, the last thing I want to do, double A batteries. This is, it seems interesting. Everybody's using uh, like, you know, nickel metal hydride or uh, lithium ion batteries and all their devices because they're lightweight, they last a long time. The problem is that if you're out in the field and you haven't charged your battery, you're, you've run it down, now what do you have to do? You have to go somewhere you can charge your battery. How nice is it to be able to go to your local Quickie Mart and buy a couple of AA batteries or a service station, buy a couple of AA batteries, put them back in the equipment, and you're good to go. This was actually a conscious decide, uh, design decision by RF System Lab to make it use AA batteries so that their guys out in the field who are using this aren't caught short when their bespoke batteries go dead. They don't have to recharge them. So the cost of this is about $9,300 to $13,500 depending on the type of insertion tube, the diameter and the length of the insertion tube that you use. So uh, 9300 to 13500 uh, Again, this is the VJ ADV video borescope from RF System Lab. And uh, thanks guys for sending that to us. By the way, like I said, did I mention? Really light. I was really surprised at holding this thing. So thanks guys for sending this to us. And Mike, back to you.
Well, there you have it, the VJADV video scope from RF System Lab. Uh, another great tech corner there from Dirk. Thank you to RF System Lab for sending that along. And uh, Dirk, I think what you said was that it was lightweight. If I got that, it yes, was it was like I've, I've had I've used bore scopes before, yeah. and the thing that was really crazy is. This thing doesn't weigh anything. Yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, it's, that's important. Like, yeah. Very often you'll use a setting down as, as we had over there, but sometimes, depending where you're at, you need to be holding mm -hmm. these, and you got your finger in a trigger and all that, sure. and you, you know, it's just, it's just nice, every, any, any way you can take off of it. Yeah, this, every but, yeah. pound counts, so yep. good stuff there. Thank you, thank you RF System Lab for sending that along. Okay, well, that's our show for the week, but before we go, we'd like to thank today's sponsor, 360 Performance Circle, a new kind of training company with handsomely produced streaming video content covering lean, quality, and best practices within test and measurement. 360 Performance Circle is your destination point for the best training on the web. For more information, check out, check out the banner ad just below or just to the right of this video player screen. Well, Derek, that's our show for the week. Uh, busy show, a lot of great stuff. Uh, that's it. And thanks, uh, thanks, Mayhul Shah from LNS Research for joining us. Uh, want, want to remind you about that one webinar again coming up next Tuesday the 17th, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. And Check out the story from Matt Littlefield for a link out to that or look out for your email to see how you can sign up. Yep. And, of, and course, of course, the folks from our system, system Lab, Lab for yep. sending us a great, great product, great borescope to check out for, uh, for this week's Tech Corner. So everyone have a great weekend and we'll see you next week here at Quality Digest Live. So long. Bye.